Uh, my, my view is this. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, uh, we've got some great speakers up here, but there's a lot of expertise in the room as well. Uh, and as much as it's nice to ask questions about the specific topics that we've had covered, I think there's just a lot of other just broad questions related to the analytics world uh, that just deserve some airtime as well. So, so that, that's the kind of the, the, the cue part is, is a chance for all of you to uh, ask some of those just general questions that may or may not relate to the sessions that have been covered. Uh, and the, the A part would be the opportunity for, for all of you to answer them as well. So this isn't you know, about asking me or about asking any of the previous speakers. It's just a chance to say just kind of in general, you want to take a, a kind of a quick uh, finger on the pulse of what's happening in the analytics world. Let's just have a discussion about that. Maybe a little bit of fun in the process. Uh, offer some, some quick wrap-up comments and then we will be uh, having drinks by 4.45, okay? So, so we can do this two ways. So we, we have the, the questions that, that uh, some folks have been, been posting, uh, but I, I wanna start uh, with, with the questions that some of you might have. So you know, we, we have the, these wonderful uh, interactive devices over here, and so you know, I could say, um, are there any questions? And I know full well that no one will uh, raise their hand and, and offer anything. Um, or I can cold call you, okay? <laughs> Uh, and in this, in this most endearing manner over here. So uh, oh, we actually have a question? Well then here, let's try it that way. <laughs> Go for it. Just talk. Does this just talk? Okay. Um, if, I, if I remember correctly, your, your, what? Is this loud? Okay. Uh, in your book, you talk about obviously that, um, and I think we heard a lot, uh, heard this a lot today that, you know, people who aren't, aren't your, most valuable customers, people who aren't in your wheelhouse, you shouldn't spend a lot of time with them. Um, the problem is that if someone has a bad experience or you know you identify them as someone who's not a, a major customer, like they can go online now and complain about it and it becomes like a huge story. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you live in an industry that's covered by global media uh, constantly, then you know you, you maybe have a problem on your hands. So. There's a, uh, it's a resource allocation question about how do you deal with the best, your best people and make sure they have a good experience, but you know, you're, you're leaving people who, with a sour taste in their mouth, who could potentially have uh, an influence overall on, on your company or your organization. Mm -hmm. So how do you, you know, how do you start reconciling All right, so Does that make sense? What I'm Evan, here, you answer that. <laughs> you, you've, you've seen all my shtick, you know everything I say. But, I was, but, I was, but I, was, I was busy typing, so could you please? Oh, okay, <laughs> then, 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 then toss it back and I'll answer it for you. So here you go, Evan. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay. Um, well, here's my quick take on it, but then I'd, I'd like to hear from the other experts. One, it's, we're never trying to um, you know, chase people away or, or create any dissatisfaction, right? We want to keep things kind of uh, efficient and happy and all that. Um, but I do believe that so many companies out there that are just paralyzed by this issue. It's like, oh, we have to be very careful around the customers where they might post a bad thing on Facebook and it might go viral. And the fact is, two things. Number one, you know, it was interesting hearing Ian talking about all the complaints and stuff. The vast majority of complaints never get reported anyway. Most of them aren't really that big. I mean, I had a bad experience with Cutter Airways, which I never complained to anyone about. Not that big a deal. But even the ones that do get posted, the chance that any one complaint is going to go viral is, you know, um, slightly, you know, uh, on the, the same level as the chance of it's going out and getting hit by lightning. It is so incredibly unusual. You know, you hear about, let's stay with the airlines industry, United bakes guitars, and you think, oh my God, I don't want that to happen to me. That doesn't happen, okay? Think about it this way. As a close approximation, that never happens. It's a one in a million thing when it does happen. And so companies shouldn't be paralyzed about the chance that it might happen. Now again, I'm not saying you should be mean to people. I'm not saying you should be dismissive, but you shouldn't stop from kind of doing the right thing for your customer base as a whole and your shareholders just because of that one in a million chance that, that you know, someone might say something 
uh, and it might go viral. I mean, that, that's like a really harsh view. And you know what? That's going to engender some other comments. So let's hear some other thoughts about it. Let's fling it down this way. Ready? Heads up, everyone. Whee! <laughs> Good grab. So, so th the thoughts about that I issue. Just, uh, I just closed the bottle. <laughs> it's good. So either that or, or other, other questions, comments about the world of, of analytics. Um, actually, my question is, is, on the, is, on the, is on the pigeonhole, but it's on, it's on visualization. Uh, uh -huh. And I think some of the people have answered it because, you know, they all, they all talked about uh, early cases, like, you know, quick wins, get people on board. I'm just trying to find out, since visualization is so important, how do you, um, you know, we, like, how do you, how do you arrive at what's good visualization? How do you, like, find out, like, like, for example, the Michael J. Fox people had that chart out there, and they found that to be, like, successful inside. I think that's what I picked up. How do you arrive at good visualization to get those early wins? Okay. In, uh, well, that's a great question because I wouldn't even pretend to answer that. So, who wants to take a shot at that? Here, well, Steve, why don't you? It's not you got to take. Use the catch box. Take no. You don't have to answer. Just flip it back there. Two. There we go. Okay. I, I think the answer was provide more sessions. It's called testing. Uh huh. Right. We develop different types of uh, visualizations and we send it out for testing and then we get our results back and that informs us of what's the best form of visualization that we could use to represent the data. It, uh, I think it's a, a theme that I think came up uh, early in the day and, and should recur more often, which is uh, triangulation. And that I think visualization is a cool thing, but it doesn't necessarily replace uh, careful testing. And when the two of them come together well, ah, it's really, really nice. Uh -huh. well, uh, is that uh, Nathaniel, right? Yeah. Uh, toss it. Let's get... Thank you. Um, I know we have a lot of uh, big minds here, great companies. As um, as a company that provides analytic services to a lot of other clients, there's a question that we're faced very often. How do you kind of um, provide the right analytics to companies that are seeking to optimize on short-term response from consumers versus long-term brand equity? Uh -huh. So if anyone has anything to share on that, that'd be great. Fantastic question. Because so much of these investments we're making in analytics is for long-run value and not for, for quick hits. So, so how do we do that successfully? How do we get people to, uh, to how do we get executives and shareholders to uh, appreciate uh, long-run benefits? Uh, thoughts on that? Or, uh, Vikram, why don't you toss that thing? Not to me. Not to me. I got nothing to say on it. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> so who wants to talk about... Um, creating long run wins. How about over here? <laughs> it's probably not that hard to find. <laughs> Thoughts? Uh, how to create long, long term wins? Yeah. Um, it's actually funny that someone brought up customer complaints because I actually work at Uber, where uh -huh. it's like a buy daily occurrence. Um, most of them go viral, it feels like. Um, <laughs> but I think, um, I think what I would say, um, I don't have a ton of experience, but you have to like draw a vision, and you have to have some sort of endpoint, and you have to convince the stakeholders that by investing in certain areas, that you can achieve the vision that you're trying to go to and get everyone's buy-in. And um, I definitely think it's possible. And I've seen a lot of change in my company um, just by following those couple steps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, then toss it. Another no question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I guess I have a question about the statistic testing side. So we know that usually it's not always that the statistic testing will work. Sometimes the test will fail, but due to various reasons, like the sample is not enough, or the pattern, the feature is not strong enough, or the uh, testing models or algorithms is not approaching enough. So 
what will you think uh, are kind of the several approaches or things come to your mind when you see a statistic test fails? When I see a, a, a what case fail? Uh, so when a statistic hypothesis test fails, uh -huh. what will, what's your suggestions to follow sure. afterwards? Well, I'm, I'm a probabilistic kind of guy, uh, and, I, and I mean that in every way, whether it comes to um, uh, hypothesis testing, when it comes to forecast, when it comes to custom behavior. So, uh, and it actually goes back to the, the, the complaint story too, is that, that everything we do as companies and as customers is, is, is kind of like a coin flip, and we can't expect to hit the mark every time. Uh, and so I think a big part of our job is just to understand kind of the, the, the nature, the extent of, of, of errors. We should expect that we're always going to be wrong it's just a question of, uh, is this unusually wrong? Is it persistently wrong? And so I think, in, in some sense, we should always expect to fail. Our forecasts are never going to hit the mark. And so it really is just having, understanding just what's the right statistical tolerance uh, for, for being off the mark. Uh, and I, I think we, unfortunately, in the field of marketing, we tend to often view it as, as too deterministic. You know, this is what will happen. I mean, one of my uh, pet peeves when we talk about customer lifetime value is the fact that anyone would ever say that the customer lifetime value of a certain customer is going to be X dollars. We never know what it's going to be, and in reality, we're always going to be wrong. So it's a question of how far off are we. So it's just, you know, in some sense, it, and not so much learning how to fail, but just, just learning to tolerate kind of imprecision and inaccuracy. I, I think that's just a big part of our job. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Let's keep tossing. And, 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 and ask a question right. for the general audience. Yeah. You don't need yeah. to hear I've from got, me. Ask and toss. I'm going to do it reverse. I'm going to add an answer to one of the other oh, questions, please. and great. then I have a, a question for everybody. Good. So I was at a conference last year. Simon Hay, who's global CEO, CEO of uh, Dunhumby, uh -huh. and someone asked him, you know, how do you get CEO? Uh, how do you get the company involved? He said, go right up to the top, get the CEO's agenda, but talk to them, or talk to him or her in their own language. So that visualization, it's something powerful, not too complex so that it's believable and irrefutable, you get that, then the pieces will start to fall together. So uh, that, that, that was his suggestion. I've seen that work. Uh -huh. my, my question is, especially for your best customers, and there's more churn in those top three deciles than a lot of people uh, believe, marketers yeah. believe. So Peter, what's, what's, what's an acceptable, acceptable migration between, uh, between deciles? And I know it varies by sector. Uh, we, you know, uh, from that perspective. Where do we get those benchmarks? I know your own benchmarks are always better. And then how do we measure that variance? Um, right. Well, so, okay, that's great. So you're picking up on that theme of understanding that, that we're going to be off uh, and, and figuring out, you know, just how much we can tolerate. And then to go one step further to say, and, and what's the, the, the nature of those errors? Is it for reasons that were things that were under our control that we screwed up? Is it uncontrollable? Is, you know, there's, there's all kinds but, of I mean, you, you may go from deciles at your top first decile, go four deciles down. Is that acceptable in, in, in one year? How much, right. how much churn goes up and down? I love that question, and it, and it relates to, since Ellie got to give a shout out to one of her new papers, give a shout out to one, uh, my a newspaper, actually, which is V of CLV. What's the variance of CLV? Uh, and what's not only what is it, but what will it be? So given the behavior on our customers so far, not only tell me what my best guess is for what that customer is going to be worth, but what do I think the variability is going to be around it? And I think it's really, so I, so I can't even answer the question for you, but I can give you the measurement paradigm that can say how much variable, variability will we expect to see uh, given what we've seen in the past. And so I think it's, it's just important to have variance as much of a part of our kind of measurement and management processes as, as means. Uh, and, and the fact there, that you're asking that yeah. is a great sign. Are there any global benchmarks in that? I mean, we know the Fred Reichold, the loyalty effect, you know, X percent of loyals get X percent of profit. Yeah. You know what? Uh, Reichold did us a great service yeah. um, in, in coming up with or at least popularizing net promoter score because that is a, a measure by its very nature is, is a variance measure. Right, it's the promoters minus the detractors. And I think that the big part of his credit 
was that we're going to learn a lot at the extremes and not just at the average in the middle. So, so that's, that is a, a good step in the right direction. And again, there are lots of benchmarks out there about what is a good NPS or a bad NPS. And that, again, rep represents. Are you a believer on, on NPS? I know uh, there's some naysayers against it. It means it's one metric. Right? I, I, I have the ultimate love-hate relationship with it. <laughs> uh, I, I love it for this reason, that it's a, it is indeed a measure of variance. It celebrates the heterogeneity of our customers. It's easy. It's compelling. Talk about visualization. I mean, you can get C-level people to appreciate it. So that, it's, it's great, it's terrific, all companies should use it. But at the same time, if you really, 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 really care about the nature of satisfaction and not just as one of many dashboard metrics, then it really doesn't do justice to the true underlying psychological richness of satisfaction. And Evan has something to say about that. Well, no, you, you, you shame me, but I wasn't ready when you threw it to me the first time. But <laughs> it's two things. One is it was a question about how do you prove value in the short term? And I mean, one approach I'd try to take is in the short term show you can do less subsidy of behavior that would have happened anyway. That's good. So it's not like a top line number, but it's a bottom line number, and that one you can prove pretty quickly. And the other one, which is more of a question, is you know there's still kind of a disconnect between methods that you know would pass a peer review in academia versus those that get used in the real world. So one that came up today a few times that I've heard before is like look-alike testing. And as much as I spent time studying with you, never heard anybody mention look-alike testing. So is that you know would that pass a peer review and other other methods out there that you know? academia doesn't believe in, but, but industry is using? Uh, so when it comes to look-like testing, I think that actually would be uh, would totally fine. I think the, the reason why you wouldn't see a lot of academics talking about it is because it's, it, I think it's so well accepted that that's a legitimate thing to do, mm. that it's just not an interesting topic to us as, okay. as uh, you know, people on the bleeding edge or whatever. The, the big question about it is how is it done? You know, what is the statistical precision that arises from it, both, again, means and variances? Mm. So I think there's, there's lots of good questions there. Mm. And, and to your point, Evan, uh, I think they're questions that academics, yeah, we buy into it, look alike. It makes all the sense in the world. But it just because it's seen to be kind of a solved problem, at least in marketing, we haven't seen people looking at, uh, into it with the new capabilities that Facebook and Google are, are putting out there. And we probably should, because everybody's using it now because it's so easy. So let's, let's be a little bit more rigorous about it. Evan, toss that thing. Got a few more minutes over here. Uh -huh. uh, Pete, maybe a, a question um, as a smaller company in the room. Um, for smaller companies who are maybe looking at some of these, uh, some folks like Thorin or Google and being like, wow, I wish I had a team like that. Um, and students that are coming out of your school, what traits in your students have you seen that's made them successful? and that we should look for if we're starting a team and maybe growing a small team. Okay, I want you to toss it way over there. Yep, yeah, to you, Ellie. Uh -huh. So, so su successful traits for a small business. What are we looking for? You want to get a good analytics platform? Oh, in a word, scrappy. You want people who will just get it done no matter what needs to be done. Uh -huh. um, so so I, I think yeah, scrappy. Um, the other thing is, I think if I was a small, if I was building a team, I would hire people out of the big teams. I really wouldn't hire a new grad. I'd hire someone who's kind of seen what all of this looks like and at least has the vision in their head. Because I don't, on it, I'd like to to think that I give the students that vision, but I really don't. Uh, I, but and Ali, uh, just a little bit of time to go. I, I mentioned uh, the Marketing Matters radio show you have. Want to give us a quick sneak preview for this Wednesday? Oh yeah, this Wednesday we're sm celebrating Small Business Week and I'm going to be a guest on the show for a half an hour talking about um, how small businesses can get a handle on data. Right, so again, Sirius XM 111, 5 to 7 on Wednesday. One more quick toss. I'm just going <laughs> to... All right, um, actually, this is to answer actually one of the questions I think you had over there about decision making at... Uh, at an executive level. So, you know, one of the things that I found really useful was really understanding who your stakeholders are, and in a typical company, it's not one person, right? And someone I think mentioned here, when you make average sales, five different people involved in that, in that process. And that's actually the hardest part. I mean, that's what sales is, but it's understanding what each of them needs. Like, you know, for example, my boss is the president of the company, and he cares about reporting up to the board. So he is all about visualization. You can create something that's very simple for him to explain his ROI, 
you're, you have that. But then you talk to my peer who is a VP of sales, a VP of services, they don't care as much about the board, they care about how to incentivize their teams. And I think if analytics, customer analytics, which is so powerful because that's the one thing that ties everything together, if you can use that as a, as a way to vis help each department leader visualize what they do, then you have huge champions on each side. So that's one of the things I, you know, I think I've learned from my own career. Uh, I actually did have a question, uh, which is, there's so many good best practices around all the companies that presented and who didn't present. Like, how do we actually learn from them more than just the high level slides? Like, you know, it's just, there's a lot of things that are actually applicable. Well, I'm in the education sector, but there's something that's applicable out of, you know, retail, out of financial that is totally applicable. But how do we actually, and it's not competitive, but how do you actually apply that? And that's actually my so question. It's a great question, and I'll answer the question with a, with, with a, a question saying, I've been like typing that question into the pigeonhole for pretty much every one of the speakers. So, um, you know, how do we achieve the kind of meta learnings? You know, above any one test that we run or one model that we run, uh, how do we continually learn and how do we get smarter about the next test? And in particular, how do we learn across companies, across sectors, across geographies? That's really hard. And you know what? I think is, is the first way to, to make that happen is conversations like this. Just getting together with people in, in uh, different functional areas, different companies that you just wouldn't have a chance to reach out to or toss a microphone to. Uh, and, I th and so I think it, it is opportunities like this that make the learning. And in fact, with that, I think it is time for us to achieve some of that learning over drinks. Uh, and so, uh, so I just want to offer, first of all, one more thank, thank you to the WCAI team, uh, that just such a wonderful group of people. <laughs> really, really, really terrific. And, and thank all of you for, for coming on over to Philadelphia and for, for playing along with us and for participating, for being heads up on the, uh, on the, the catch box thing. Uh, but I really do hope that it's, it's a conversation that will continue not only for the next hour. Where are we doing it for the next hour? The so the, the far room where the lunch The far lunch room room. So uh, let us all reconvene over there uh, and we'll uh, keep on going. Okay.